Welcome to the Herald Democrat Sports Podcast. I'm the sports editor of the Herald Democrat, Jason Del Rosa, and you're listening to the latest edition of the Herald Democrat Sports Podcast. We have ended the regular season. The playoffs are about to begin. We have teams advancing. We have a team already in the second round. We'll talk about that. And we have some teams that unfortunately had their season's end this past Friday night. So we've got plenty to talk about, plenty to analyze. So we're going to jump right in, and here's how we're going to do it. We're going to talk about the teams that didn't make the playoffs, give them a little bit of a recap. Then we will focus on the teams that did make the playoffs, go from top to bottom, talk about the matchups in the bye district round, recap how they finished their end of their seasons, and that's how we'll put it all together as we get ready for the first round of the playoffs. So, unfortunately, the teams that we're talking about right now did not make the playoffs. Uh, There's a handful of them in our area. We actually did very well in terms of getting teams into the playoffs. Um, It it helps when you have some of these, uh, you know, realignment, uh, move some people around, move some districts around, uh, gave people uh, some more chances to to get into the playoffs. So we had a good number, but unfortunately we had a couple of teams come up short. And uh, unfortunately both of our 5A teams in Sherman and Denison did not make it, uh, although they came somewhat close. So we'll talk about them first. We'll talk about the Sherman Bearcats, uh, uh, who ended their season in 6-5A Division One with a win, 48-13 to against Frisco Liberty down at the Star. Um, a very good finish for the Bearcats. Uh, we talked about winning last week, uh, trying to be a spoiler, beating Frisco Wakeland. Uh, so they end on a two-game winning streak to take into the offseason. Uh, in this one, uh, not close from the start, 19 nothing after the first quarter. Um, 30, uh, 30, it was a 34 to nothing at had a 35 to nothing at halftime. Um, and they were able to cruise from there. Um, uh, some big offensive numbers for some guys that we'll talk about, uh, going into next season, uh, led by Caleb Orr, uh, 17 of 29 passing 308 yards, uh, four touchdowns and an interception, uh, Kane Bowen, 19 carries, 140 yards and a touchdown, uh, Dracavian Hughes, Five carries, 69 yards, and a touchdown. Uh, Phoenix Grant wrapped up his career. uh, Eight catches for 166 yards and three touchdowns. Uh, Vontrell Sanders finished his career. Four four catches uh, for 75 yards as well. Uh, Dane Castleberry uh, goes out on a high kicking note with three field goals. uh, And Sherman, like we said, cruised in this one. uh, Had over 500 yards of offense uh, while Frisco Liberty barely got to 150 Um, and if not for a long, uh, kickoff return, uh, in the final minute, uh, probably would have ended at with, uh, with seven points instead of getting to 13. Uh, but just, just an overall, uh, strong performance on both sides of the ball. And that's the one thing we talked about last week. Um, you know, you had a, a, a Frisco Liberty team that was 0 and 9, trying to avoid going 0 and 10. Um, and of course you have a Sherman team that had been eliminated from the playoffs already. Um, you never know which team is going to want it more, which team is going to want to be there, um, which team is going to want to play for some pride uh, to finish out the season. Uh, and, and Sherman showed that in, in a big way uh, with their performance. And, and it kind of maybe uh, perhaps gave a sneak peek uh, of what you were going to see uh, with Caleb Orr at a quarterback spot. Um, you know, got uh, got his chance really the last five games. Um to, to kind of show what he could do, um, had, had some, had some games like this, um, had some, had some good moments, um, you know, in some losses. Um, and I think it's just about maybe, uh, perhaps being a little bit more consistent, a little bit more, uh, able to take care of the ball. Um, but outside of that, I think you saw from a sophomore, um, getting some significant run, um, you know, that he's obviously, uh, in, in line to be the starting QB going forward. Um, and, and also in the backfield in, in Kane Bowen, um, who had spent, um, you know, uh, probably two thirds or, or 75% of his, uh, season at linebacker, uh, and doing well there, uh, the last couple games, unfortunately with Caleb Thompson, uh, being sidelined with a medical issue, uh, not able to finish his career on the field, um, these last two games, but Bowen steps in, gets the lion's share of the carries, um, goes over a hundred yards in each game. Scores in each game, um, and then you have another, and you have another sophomore uh, in Hughes, where you know th- these two guys in this game combined for over 200 yards. Um, you know that's a nice potential tandem going forward. 
um, with with what you can see. Obviously, um, when you look at the offense uh, from a receiving standpoint, you're going to be losing, um, you know, some of your main guys. Um, you know, Grant, uh, who's kind of been in all everything this year, bouncing around and, and getting the ball in his hands a lot of a lot of different ways. But down the stretch, when they moved or to, to quarterback and moved Phoenix Grant out of that. Uh, you know, he, he made some big plays at receiver, but obviously he's not going to be back. Um, you know, he's committed to Yale. Uh, Vontrell Sanders, you know, had had a, had a really good year in, in leading uh, Sherman in receiving. I had, had um, you know, seven touchdowns. Uh, you know, it was really a big play threat for them the whole, you know, from, from game one, um, you know, to, to the end. Uh, J.D. Park is another senior, um, you know, had a handful of touchdowns um, and is a multi-year starter. So the, I think the biggest questions are going to be, um, at that receiver spot, uh, because there's going to be a lot of jobs up for grabs. Um, you know, but they did have some, you know, Kobe Ray Shorts, uh, another one of those young guys, um, who kind of came on here in the second half of the season. Um, so, so there are some pieces there and there's, there's going to be some guys back on, on defense as well. Um, you know, again, much like this year where, um, they have some holes to fill at some spots, you know, there's going to be some spots in the secondary you know, you're going to lose a guy like a Connor Clark, um, you know, has been a multi-year starter, some guys on the line, um, you know, that, that either were, were returning starters that were seniors or, or popped up this year, whether it was a Latarian Sims or a Chaz Brown, um, uh, you, you had guys that, that made an impact, um, that are going to need to be replaced. But, but this was a year when you look at that Sherman defense, um, you know, they had to replace some holes last year and they did a pretty good job of that. Um, you know, for, for on, there were a lot of games that Sherman was in because of the defense. Um, and so I think you have to just kind of trust them to be able to plug those holes. And if they can find, um, a couple of receiving options, uh, based on what you've seen down the stretch, I think there's some, some, some hope going in there. And then we look at, you know, you look at, you know, Sherman finishes four and six and three and five. Um, they tie for, um, sixth place. They're two games out of a playoff spot, you know, and if you want to look at the silver lining of it, you say, well, Sherman lost two district games, one 14 to seven and one 13 to six. And if you flip those games, they tie for third place. They would, they could have been part of a tie for third place. Maybe they get in on a tiebreaker. Maybe they don't, but it would have felt a lot better than, you know, all their games would have mattered to the end of the season. And, uh, you know, I know it probably is still painful to mention the battle of the ax, but that's another, another game that, that looked like that was going to be a win. Um, Sherman wasn't able to hold on. I mean, that's three out of your six losses right there. Um, you know, you could easily flip and say, well, the best case scenario for Sherman this year would have been, um, you know, a seven and, uh, you know, a seven and three record. Um, and of course, you know, the, the teams that they did lose to, you talk about an undefeated Reed team, um, a Lone Star team that finished eight and two and in second place. And then, uh, um, uh, the Frisco, uh, the Frisco team that that tied it was part of that three-way tie uh, for third place. Didn't end up making the playoffs. They were the odd team out. Those were the three lopsided losses right there. Um, but I think, like I said, if if you're if you're looking at it, there's it's it's not that far away. Um, obviously, this is a very um, it's a very competitive district. Um, you know, Sherman tied Centennial, uh, the, one of the teams that it lost to uh, in those close games. Um, but when you look at, you know, the winner was 8-0, the second place team was 6-2, and two, and then you have a three-way tie um, for third place uh, at 5-3, and three, you know, a lot of people beat up on each other. Some people beat people that were surprises. Obviously, Sherman being Wakeland, um, you know, ended up being one of those games. Um, so it's not it's not that far away. If you just flip uh, a couple of a couple of drives or, or, or a, game, a game or two, um, you know, you're right there in the mix, and I think that's all you can ask. Uh, if you're Sherman going into the off season, um, especially off the two game winning streak, you know, if, if they would have ended two and eight, uh, and having lost to Liberty, who had not won a game and had not looked good at all, um, this season, I think that, that, that obviously changes, um, a lot of perspectives, but when you show the fight and you show the ability and you show what you can do, um, uh, not just against a bad team and that, that goes 0 and 10, but against a team that ends up getting the third seed for the playoffs, um, I, I think you're frustrated and you're frustrated for a good reason, because if you're good enough to beat that team that, that got the third seed, then you should be able to be better than tied for sixth in the standings. And so I think that's good motivation. 
um, for Sherman going into the offseason. And I think you could probably say um, the same thing for the Denson Yell Jackets, who, uh, did not make, who did not make the playoffs uh, after making it the last couple of years. Um, they uh, ended with a win as well. They beat Mesquite Poteet to finish 7-5A Division II action, 30-14. to um, and, and again, this was um, another situation where um, you, you go into your last game, um, it's your last game at home, you, it's, so you have you senior night and all that sort of stuff. Um, you know, how are you going to compete? How are you going to show um, people that, how you're going to finish out this season after you lose a game the week before that, that eliminated you from the playoffs? Um, and then you, you get ready for this game and you're down your starting quarterback uh, who gets injured in the last game and is not able to return in time. Um, you are down some depth. Uh, because of a of, uh, uh, bug, flu bug, whatever goes through the team. Um, first quarter, your starting running back goes down, and you turn around and you're saying, who are we going to give this ball to? And we give it to a couple of linebackers and a freshman, um, three guys that have never touched the ball on offense um, at the varsity level, and you somehow find a way to get a win. Um, you know, you're, you're up uh, 17 to 14 at halftime. Um, you, hold, you, you, you pitch a shutout in the second half. And you get um you get some some big plays from some guys that maybe you didn't expect. Um, number one in this game would be Jacoby DeHorney, you know, who's a starting linebacker. Uh, ends up with seven carries for um 58 yards and three touchdowns. Uh, the very first touch for him at the varsity level, he goes 33 yards for a touchdown. Uh, and then you get um a touchdown catch by Kyson Lusane, who had a great season for uh the Yellow Jackets. Um, he catches a touchdown pass from Ty Rhodes. Um, who filled in pretty admirably, um, you know, for Josh Kurtenbach. We didn't know if he was going to be able to play or not. Uh, he he ended up not being able to, um, except for a couple of kneel downs at the end to to be able to get on the field one last time. Um, um, and we talk about some other guys chipping in. Uh, you know, Lathan Bailey, another another starting linebacker, uh, ten carries for fifty eight yards. Jalen Butler, the freshman, uh, seven carries for forty one yards. Um, so despite the fact um, that things were not going well. Um, from a depth standpoint, still able to put up over 200 yards rushing. Uh, Rhodes ends up throwing for 174 yards, uh, 15 of 24 with the touchdown, did have two interceptions. Um, and uh, Lusane ends up with 10 catches for 127 yards and the score there. And and again, just a, a really good sign. Um, you know, again, this was both these teams um, went into the, the second to last game needing to win um, to stay alive. They were unable to do that. Um, and so this was a pride game. Uh, this was a show us if you want to be here game. Um, and I think Denison got a really good answer with that. So they finished five and five on the season, uh, three and four in district play. They finished in fifth place, uh, one game back of Terrell. But of course, if they would have, um, if they would have tied Terrell in the standings, they would have lost, uh, because they had the tiebreaker. So essentially, you know, looking back at that game between Denison and Terrell, that was the difference. If Denison wins that, these, those two are flip flopped. Denison would have gotten the four seed, um, and uh, Terrell would have been out. Um, and so again, I, I know I, we mentioned it. I think I mentioned it last week, where you know Coach Whitson said it's better to be uh, five and five looks better than four and six, and he's not wrong. Um, and you want to finish as best as you can. Um, and unfortunately for Denison, um, what they've done the last you know f- probably six or seven years, when you look at their record. You know, they tend to lose to the teams in front of them, which is good because they win the games that you you, you figure they're going to win. It's a question of can you win the games um, of the teams ahead of you. Um, and, you know, they played uh, Melissa, um, as who ends up winning the district championship by one point over Lovejoy. After Lovejoy, you know, they played Melissa as tough as anybody, uh, only losing by the, by, um, the 10 points. And, um, again, you know, the, the four losses, uh, in district play to the four teams in front of them and their other loss on the season was to Frisco Reedy who went 10 and 0. Um, and so when you look at the teams that beat you, you lost to a 10 and 0, uh, Reedy team, uh, an eight and two Melissa team an eight and two Crandall team whose only two losses were to Melissa and Lovejoy. Um, Lovejoy finished seven and three and, and Tara was five and five. So, um, you look at those records of those teams. Obviously, you're you're not losing to any of the teams below you, and that's a, and that's good. That's I mean that's a good baseline because at least you're beating the teams that you're supposed to to stay in the race. The only question is, can you beat that one extra team that you need to beat? In this case, in this in this case, uh, this year that was Terrell, and they weren't able to do that. 
Uh, but we talk about you know the future being bright in in Sherman. I think you can say uh, the same uh, for Denison in a lot of respects. Um, you know they have a, a dynamic playmaker at, at receiver who's coming back in, in Lusane. Um, Jack Allman is going to be back um, at running back. He's the leading rusher. Um, Grant Yerkes was a was a was a good addition as a, as a second guy in the backfield. Um, who also missed this last game, um, but he's he's going to be back. Um, you know, it's looking like Ty Rhodes is going to uh, take over at the quarterback spot for Kurtenbach. Um, and who, which, which you know, before the season started, you really didn't know what you were going to get with with Josh Kurtenbach. Um, you know, he was he had played receiver the year before. Obviously, you had an established starter um, at the quarterback position. Um, and and see, we didn't see a whole lot of him at quarterback. Um, and and you know, he. He he was he was probably better than than advertised in terms of what what the expectations were. Um, you know he had he had some some big passing games. Um, he had some big run big running games. Sometimes he combined those into one game. Um, you know he he you could say there's 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 two two probably three of those wins. You know he almost single handedly earned those by himself with the way he played. Um, and, and so obviously I think, you know, you're looking at a great leader there for a guy to step in, um, you know, following all the guys on offense that they lost to be able to step in and, and at least get them to five and five and get them to be in, stay in the mix the last couple, until the last couple weeks of the season. Um, but we saw some stuff with Ty Rhodes. Um, you know, we saw some of the flashes that, that, um, you know, as, as he continues to get better in the off season, um, you know, goes through another off season, seven on seven, all that sort of stuff. Um, you know, I, I think that's a spot that you don't, you know, you know what you're, what you're going to be getting there. Um, the, you know, the question is going to be, um, you know, I hate to say much like at, much like at Sherman, um, can you find a complimentary guy to, to somebody coming back at the receiver spot, um, you know, to, to take the pressure off Hussein this year, that was, that was Ty Kirkbride, um, who, who, you know, was a three-year starter, um, you know, is going to, is going to leave as one of the, uh, you know, with one of the top, uh, you know, 15 or so uh, catch numbers in school history, um, you know, but some of the other guys that were starters this year um, at the receiver spots were were seniors as well, um, whether you're talking about a Ryder Pool or you're talking about a Colby Carrington, uh, tight end, tight end, tight end with Aaron Schaefer was a spot where a senior um, as well. And so if you can find some guys um, you know, Rhodes was Rhodes was the receiver. Obviously, he's going to be making the move to you know much like Kurt Bach did last year. Um, so that's going to open up another spot for some playing time. Um, can Can Dennison find the guys um, like Lusane, who you know he was not on the varsity last year, has a huge monster breakout year. If you find another one of those guys, um, you know I think you've got you you're you're really good. Obviously, there's going to be some spots on the offensive line that are open. Canyon Ives is is a is a three year guy at center. Um, just the anchor of that line who's going to be gone. So you've got holes to fill there, um, but there's not as many as there were last year. And the same thing on defense. You know, you, we, th- this was a defense obviously this year that struggled at times um, when it played some of those better teams. You know, it gave up large point totals, um, and and a lot of that was we talked before the season. You you had a defense that had so many guys that were three year starters, and now you only have two guys coming back um, out of that group coming into this year. You know, you had to replace nine starters, um, and there was a lot of mixing and matching and trying to find guys and s- doing some different schemes um, because it was it was hard to find guys at certain spots. Um, but you have Jacoby DeHorney coming back. Um, you have Kenyon Kelly coming back in the secondary. Um, you have some guys. Kevontae Hain uh, at one of the defensive end spots um, was really good. You've got guys that you can you have as cornerstones at each level. And um, there were a lot of guys that got playing time, and the question is, can they continue that maturation process? Can they get stronger? Can they get faster? Um, they've they've got maybe uh, maybe not ten games of experience, but maybe they started the last four games, or they started the last uh, whatever number of games, just to be able to get snaps at the varsity level and 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 just get acclimated to it. So um, I think at the very least, you know, just much like with Sherman, we're talking about a Denison team that's going to be in the mix, and they know the path because Melissa's not going to go away. Um, Lovejoy's not going to go away. Um, Crandall's going to have some kids graduate, so that's going to be interesting to see what happens with them. And same thing with Terrell, but they're both going to have guys back that are problems. 
Um, and the Denison has some guys that are problems too. Um, and the question is, can you win one of those games to get into the top four? Um, that's the good thing about the second year of a realignment. You have a baseline. Um, a lot of people thought that Denison could be in the mix as, 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 as a third place team, maybe a fourth place team in the district. Now you know what it takes to get there. You got to beat Poteet, Greenville, and Princeton again, but you got to find a way to beat Terrell and Crandall. And if you beat one of them, there's a pretty good chance that you're going to get in. And if you beat both of them, then the question is, um, you know, can you pull an upset on a Melissa or a Lovejoy like you almost did with Melissa? So, so that's a look at the two 5As who unfortunately did not make the playoffs. Uh, we'll work our way down uh, to the 3A level. And we'll talk about the SNS Rams. Um, they uh, moved out west. We talked about that before the season. Um, uh, what that was going to be like in terms of of uh, their chances. Um, they were in a, a smaller district. They only they only playing only playing the five games now. Um, and and unfortunately they were unable to uh, to stay in the mix. Although they were in it till till late in the season because of this the size of the district. But they finished one and nine. And 0-5, um, they finished two games out of a playoff spot. Henrietta got the last spot at 2-3. and three. And so the path there, when we talk about the Rams, um, going into next year, you got to beat Valley View and you got to beat Henrietta at a minimum, and that would get you fourth place um, as Holiday and Kalisburg were in the top two spots. Um, and so they end up, end up losing to City View to end their season. Um, and again, it was... Um, there were some, there were some good moments. Obviously they, they were, they, they picked up a win over a playoff team in white, right? Um, but, but ultimately, you know, just, um, a, a lot of, a lot of struggles on both sides of the ball in terms of, of keeping games close and putting together, um, a consistent, um, a consistent, uh, showing, um, you know, it's, it's just one of those things when you're trying to, trying to build a program and you have new coaches and trying to figure things out. Um, you know, one week something looks good, and the next week it doesn't. Um, you know, and to be fair to um, to SNS, you know, they have the nine losses, and you know, you look at the teams they lost to, and you're looking at you say, oh, that's a playoff team, that's a playoff team, that's they beat a playoff team, um, they lost to another playoff team. Uh, obviously, in their district, um, four of those four of those losses are to playoff teams. So I think when you look at the nine losses, eight of them are to playoff teams. So, you know, there, I don't think there's anybody on that list that you could say, well, um, SNS should have beat that team um, or not. Um, you know, it, I mean, if you're playing good teams, um, you have some good moments against those teams, um, and, and you just do the best you can. Um, there's gonna be there's gonna be so, some changes uh, because of the, there were there were some seniors at some key spots. Um, but I'm interested to see what SNS can do, you know, after kind of going through this season and seeing what, uh, seeing what worked and what didn't. And, and they had some bright spots, but it's, but obviously, um, you know, it's, it's, it, it's, it's, it's at the top of that district. It's a very good district. And like I said, when you're playing, uh, when you look at their, when you look at their schedule and you see, um, you know, Tioga made the playoffs and how made the playoffs and Collinsville made the playoffs. Um, I don't know how much you could ask, uh, of SNS when you, when you're playing those teams. Um, to come away with, um, you know, uh, a winning record, let alone a better record than what they had. So um, it's going to be interesting to see, you know, how, how they put things together there. Um, you know, the, the running game had its moments. The, the you know, the passing was a struggle, you know, really settling on a quarterback and finding some consistency there in the passing game. Um, you know, I think that's obviously something that's going to be uh, at the forefront. I, I don't think, um, you know, I don't think, their the defense was as bad as it may have looked on paper just because when the offense is struggling that bad it's it's really hard to 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 stay in games um because you're just giving the other team so many opportunities you know but there were there were some moments where you know that the they were in games at through a quarter or at halftime and they just the either the depth got them I, mean, I know there were some injuries late that that affected some guys and and moving people around um but it wasn't like some, you know, some of these teams you look at and it's, oh, we're down 28 nothing in the first quarter and and it's it's over from there. You know, there's games where, um, you know, SNS has a lead at halftime, they just can't hang on to it. Um, and you, if you can take a step forward or a couple of steps forward, um, you know, maybe turn some of those into wins. 
you know, and like we said, we know what the path is in that district. Um, it could be interesting to see um, the progression that SNS makes uh, if they're if they if they're able to put some stuff together um, going into next season. Um, so that is the only three A team uh, that did not make it into the playoffs. Luckily, we had um, all the other local three A teams uh, get in, um, and so we'll go down to two uh, A. Uh, which has the last team that did not make the playoffs, and that's Tom Bean. Uh, they weren't going to make it anyway because of the UIL uh, ruling that has banned them for this playoffs and next playoffs. Um, I, I guess if there is a silver lining, whatever that may be, um, they didn't make the playoffs, which I guess that doesn't hurt as much if you finish 2-8 uh, and 0-5 and and overall in 6-2A Division One, I. I guess it's good to be banned if you don't make the playoffs, as opposed to, well, if they would have finished, um, you know, 2-3 and three or 3-2 three and two in this district and gotten in, and then be told, well, you don't get to go play because um, you've been banned. So, um, unfortunately, um, that, ca- that that is a, something that had hung over uh, Tom Bean um, since that ruling was made before district play, um, and they ended their season with a 34-8 to eight loss, um to Trenton, uh, which ended up missing the playoffs. They had to win, so Trenton, had, Trenton definitely had something to play for, um, but they did not get the right combination of results, and they actually ended up losing a tiebreaker against White Wright, who obviously we'll talk about here in a minute. Um, and if you look at the, the last game, um, Bobby Rogers catches a, a touchdown pass from Branson Ashlock for the uh, the points. Uh, DJ Pearson ran in the conversion. Uh, Alex Sanchez, six catches for 69 yards. Uh, Pearson ended up with uh, 50 yards and 25 carries. Um, and the biggest thing for Tom Bean this year under a new head coach and Coach Fex, um, they had to show improvement. Uh, last year was uh, was very bad across the board, both sides of the ball. You go 0-9, uh, you get shut out six times. Um, you're, you know, you're, you're not competitive in any of your games. Um, and you look at this year's team, obviously um, – you won two games, um, you know, finishing at two and eight. Um, the the offense was better, the defense was better, um, and so now you you have a baseline after the first year of a new coach um, who has um, you know is going to have some key losses. Uh, DJ Pearson being one of them, he had you know so a really really strong year on both sides of the ball, um, but a lot but there were not a lot of there's not a lot of seniors. This is not a senior heavy group, so. Um, I'm interested to see if Tom Bean's able to make that next step just from a program standpoint, because we know they're not going to make the playoffs. Um, can you rattle some cages in that district and force them to say, okay, you finished third or fourth. Um, you, you know, we've got to bump down the next team, um, to really set things up for, um, 2024 when you are eligible for the playoffs, because a lot of these guys, um, you know, our sophomores now, freshmen now, they're going to be seniors and juniors there. Um, and like we said, um, you know, Tom Bean was better. Um, they played, they played games that were, that were closer. Um, they, they, they made people pay attention to him this year. Whereas last year we talked about it, you know, falling behind, uh, super, uh, big in the, in the first quarter at halftime. And then the game's over from there. Um, that was not the case, um, so much this year. Um, and so obviously that's a good sign. It shows that, um, there's a, there's a good core there. Um, they didn't let last year affect them. Um, and they, they, they made, they made some progress. The question is, can you keep on that upward trajectory? Um, and and so that's going to be interesting to see with Tom Bean, um, how they continue to move forward. Um, they were able to break out of what last year was, Took those took those baby steps. Can you can you make the next steps um, towards towards being in the mix uh, in the top four in the standings? So those are the teams that did not make it, um, and we'll talk about the teams right now that did. And one of those teams did not play last week, so we don't even have a game to talk about. Uh, and that's the Van Alstein Panthers because they had already uh, locked up their spot in the standings, uh, and they had the district by in five four eight division two, um, and so we knew. Uh, before this last weekend, uh, that they were going to be the second seed because they had beaten Gainesville the week before. And so the matchup in this Class 4A Division II Region 2 by district game 
That is going to be at 7 p.m. on Friday at Kimbrough Stadium in Plano. Uh, is Van Alstein, who is six and four, against Quinlan Ford, who is five and five. Um, this is going to be uh, one of those games where you want to get there because if you don't, it may be over if you're late. Um, you have two teams that love to run the ball. Uh, Quinlan Ford had a really good had a really good season uh, last year, uh, the best in school history. In fact, they went 12 and one. Um, they had never won double digits before and they did it last year. Um, they're, they're obviously not as good because they're five and five. Um, but they still have some of the elements of, uh, that rushing attack that was so good last year. And we've seen from Van Alstine, uh, with that duo of Dakota Howard and, uh, Jaden Mahan that, um, they're going to run, run, run. I think Quinlan Ford's going to run, run, run. Um, I think this could be a high scoring game, but it could go quick, um, just because the ball is going to stay on the ground a lot. Um, and I think obviously, um, you have both teams that had success in the playoffs last year, um, you know, getting past the first round. Um, and so I, I, I think it's going to be a shootout. I think this, I feel like this has like 40, 40, 48, 49, 42, 56, 49 all over it. I think there's a lot of, of, um, uh, a lot of running, uh, big plays. I, 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 for whatever reason, I, I just get that vibe about this game. Um, and so that, so it's going to be interesting to see what happens. Um, you know, like I said, you, you've got, you've got two very similar, I think two very similar opponents, um, who both have playoff success, uh, in their back pocket from last year to where, um, you know, the returning guys either were, were obviously starters on that or were, were key players or they were just around a program that won and, and, and that can that can go a long way for a lot of people. Um, so I think that's going to be an interesting matchup. Um, the winner will play the Carthage Pittsburgh winner in the area round. Um, if I was betting and I'm not, I would bet that's probably going to be Carthage. Um, but uh, either way, uh, that's the look ahead if you want to uh, start to plan ahead. So again, so Van Alstein is going to play Quinlan Ford. In a 4A Division II Region II by district game Friday, 7 p.m. at Kimbrough Stadium in Plano. Um, moving down to the 3A level, where we have a majority of our playoff teams residing. Uh, I guess we'll talk about Gunner and get them out of the way um, because uh, let's talk, we'll talk about last week first. So Gunner uh, ends up finishing district play. Uh, they win the outright 8 3A Division II championship. They've won 45 district games in a row, and the latest was a 49 to uh, nothing victory over Blue Ridge. Um, and this was a game that was 35 nothing at halftime. Uh, Ivy Hellman with a big game in this one um, in terms of touchdowns. Um, unfortunately, as, as people know, uh, with Gunner, the, the stats are not eye popping because it's hard to have eye popping stats when you kill everybody and you spread the ball around like they do. Um, but Ivy Hellman has three carries for 31 yards and two touchdowns. He has two catches for 42 yards and a touchdown pass, uh, touchdown catch from Walker Overman, uh, who goes six of six for 84 yards uh, with that touchdown pass. Um, and he also has another one uh, to Cole Harpole. Um, Ethan Sloan, nine carries, 64 yards and a touchdown. Uh, we have another uh, special teams touchdown in this one. Uh, Colin Peacock with the 49-yard punt return. Um, Blue Ridge barely gets to 100, 150 yards. Um, only has seven first downs. Uh, it's the third straight shutout uh, for Gunner to end the regular season. Uh, they shut out uh, Lone Oak and uh, Leonard uh, before playing Blue Ridge. And I believe that is their sixth. On the season, I'm gonna go back and look. I should have looked that up before. I said, uh, uh, now yeah, let's see. Well, there's another one. So that's their fourth of the season, um, because they they did shut out uh training. Oh yes, they gave up six points in that other game. So they were that close to having um five of their nine games uh uh on the field um five of the nine games be shutouts. Um, and so they, they, they took care of business. Like, like I'm sure a lot of people thought that they would. Um, and now they're supposed to go into the, to the playoffs 
And it just so happened that their first round opponent was supposed to be Cedar Hill Trinity Leadership. Who, if you remember way back in their first game, which of course was not week one because Gunner could not find somebody to play them. Uh, they had to wait a week and they got Trinity Leadership Cedar Hill. They beat them 67 to 6. And they really didn't try to make it. It could have been worse. Let's just say that. And that was they were going to rematch here in the first round of the season. And they set it up and they put out the info and they were going to play. And I saw the, I got the info and put it on my schedule. And then I go to do the Sherman game because that was the only game on Friday. And Gunner says, we got a forfeit win because Trinity Leadership called us back and they're not going to play. So I know that's frustrating for Gunner. It's bad enough that you can't get people to play you in the regular season when the wins don't matter because you can lose a non you can lose all your non-district games and it doesn't matter. Um, but then to get to the playoffs and to have a team uh, not want to play you in a game that would actually matter, um, I know obviously you know and and they can say for whatever reason you can say you could say it's injuries, you can say it's grades because it's that time of year. You could say, after losing 67 to 6, what's the point? Obviously, um, you know, you make the playoffs. I think you should show up and play unless, you know, like I said, unless, unless the injuries and there's sickness and you, you you just literally cannot feel the team, I would like to think that you would show up and um, at least do your best. Uh, but that did not happen here. And so Gunner's going to get the forfeit. Uh, they're going to advance and uh, they will await... Um, an opponent, um, which, again, I don't know if that's good. I mean, they get two weeks off, so I don't know if that matters or not. Um, obviously, you know, this is the third week that they've had off, um, which, again, I know is frustrating for um, for them because they want to play. And, you know, they they'd already had the one game um, not get played, so now, so now there's two games. Um, they're going to play the winner of the Jacksboro City View uh, matchup in the first round. So, um, so Gunner's just kind of hanging out, and so that's so we figured we might as well get them out of the way because there is no game to preview, uh, because there is no game, um, and I know that's Division Two, and, and I skipped over Division One, but I figured it would just get the let's just get the, them out of the way because of just a, such a unique situation. Um, so to the games that will be played in Three A, uh, this week, um, will be go to Three A Division One Region One. And this by district game has Whitesboro playing Vernon. Uh, Whitesboro is eight and one. Uh, they ended district play last week with a sixty nine to twenty nine win against Ponder. Uh, we talked going into that game. Um, they already had the second seed locked up, um, so they knew uh, you know there was no playoff implications or seeding implications uh, in this game. Um, and they, but they came out and did what they have done against uh, you know to a lot of opponents, uh, put up some big numbers. Um, and when you look at those numbers um, from this game, uh, and I guess the team uh, in Ponder that didn't have anything to play for, um, when you look at that, when you look at those stats, um, Grayson Ledbetter, um, 19 carries, 189 yards, uh, two touchdowns. Uh, Max Max Parker, nine carries, 136 yards, and a touchdown. Uh, Mac Harper didn't have to do a lot through the air in this one. Six of 11 passing was for 160 yards though, so you can talk. You know the big plays are coming, um, and he had um, he had four touchdowns um, passing, and he also ran for a touchdown, nine carries for 47 yards there. Uh, Brett Donaldson, two catches for 70 yards. Uh, both of those catches went for touchdowns. Uh, Carter Sluter, Carter Sluter uh, three catches, 67 yards, and a touchdown. Uh, Gavin Brown also had a touchdown as well. And uh, Kaysen Williams, returned a kickoff 80 yards for a score in that one. Um, so Whitesboro tuned up, ready to go uh, into the playoffs. Uh, this game is going to be Thursday night at 7 o'clock at Wichita Falls Memorial Stadium against Vernon, who is 6-4. and four. Um, And again, we've talked about Whitesboro all season. Um, this is, can you get back to the region final where we assume Brock is going to be waiting you're on the other side of the bracket, which is where you were last year, to 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 set to go to the region final. Um, we didn't know that was going to happen last year. They went on that great run 
Um, and I, and I'm, you know, there are some people that um, are picking Whitesboro to win this region. Of course, the, the one loss, you know, inches away from beating Brock at Brock. Um, so we know, it, uh, you know, these teams are, are very evenly matched. What's going to happen on a neutral field if we get there? And I think that's the biggest thing if you're Coach Fagan and the coaches over there um, to keep to keep the kids focused on Vernon and then focus on the Denver City Dalhart winner, which is what you would get if you beat Vernon. Because um, I think looking ahead, knowing that Brock is on the other side, knowing you're just as good as them, that you probably should have beaten them, that you were that close to beating them, don't take your eye off the prize. You've got to win these games in front of you to get back to the region final to get the rematch if Brock gets there. Um, you don't want to get tripped up looking ahead against an opponent you think you should be. And you, you know you're eight and one. Vernon is six and four. Um, you know Vernon's um, feeling pretty good about themselves because they were one and nine last year. Um, they haven't had a winning record since 2014. Here they are at six and four. I'm sure nobody's going to pick them. Everyone's saying, oh, there's no way you're going to beat Whitesboro, whatever, blah, blah, blah. Um, so they're the underdog. They get nothing to lose. And probably everybody you play is probably going to look at you, is probably going to be looked at as an underdog. So if, if Whitesboro does what it, it showed they can do last year and what they've done through nine games this year, I think a lot of people expect to see that rematch in the in the region final. But you got to take care of business. you got to go on the road, make a pretty decent road trip. You're in Region 1. You did all those road trips last year. This should be a breeze in terms of, of, of being able to prepare um, for the long road trips. Just do, what you, just do what you need to do each week, and you'll get back to where you were, and we'll, and we'll let the chips fall where they may if you can get there. But don't, don't get caught looking ahead. That's the, that's the one thing I worry about um, with Whitesboro. You know, it was the best season in school history last year. A lot of those guys are back, and the big expectation has been we're going to do it again. And they're on they're on their way to doing that. You just don't wanna you don't wanna get tripped up. Uh, the other game in three A Division One is in Region Two, and that's Pottsboro, and they're taking on Gladewater. Uh, this is a game that's at uh, Paris High School at 7 p.m. on Thursday night, and Pottsboro comes in at nine and one. After they won last week to win the outright 5-3A Division I title with a 47-28 win against Mount Vernon. Uh, and Gladewater's coming off a close win. Uh, they won 41-35 against White Oak. Um, and that is interesting because that is only Gladewater's third win. They are 3-7. and seven, And they're coming in on a, um, on a good note. So that's interesting for them. Maybe they got a little momentum uh, on their side. And, and if... For those who do remember, um, a couple years ago, when Pottsboro made their run um, to the to be the state runner-up, um, this was a matchup in the region semifinals um, that Pottsboro won 35-34 in double overtime when they had all those close games and they kept winning. They looked like a team of destiny. They found ways to win all those close games. Um, now, nobody's, nobody's left. I mean, because obviously you would have been a... You would have had to have been a freshman, um, so I don't know how many freshmen c- uh, contributed on, for both of these teams, but it is recent history um, between these two in the playoffs. I don't, I don't think this is going to be as close a matchup, but you never know, and that's the great thing about um, you know being being in the playoffs. You know, Gladewater is normally a pretty good program out there in East Texas. This is their first losing season uh, since 2017, uh, and you have a Pottsboro team that's looked really good. Um, you know, a lot of people thought, oh, maybe they were going to lose to Winsboro. Um, they beat Winsboro. Oh, what, Mount Vernon's really good, even though they lost to Winsboro. Um, you got to go to you go to go to Mount Vernon to try to avoid a three way tie for to share the district championship. Um, you go and win that game, forty seven twenty eight. Um, and it's been it's been pretty constant when you watch Pottsboro. You know, from week one, and again, the only loss they have is to Whitesboro, and. I know it's looking way ahead, and both of these regions are really good. But how fun would it be if Whitesboro won Region 1 and Pottsboro won Region 2 and we could get a rematch of that game that came down to uh, the final drive for a spot in the state championship game? That would just be delicious. So I'm rooting for that because that would be awesome to have um, those two teams going that far. 
Um, but you will get White that Pottsboro. That's the only game that they lost. That they lost to, to Whitesboro. Um, they they scored twenty seven points in that game, and that's that's more or less been uh, the low water mark for them. They've 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 continued to pile up points in this game. They had forty seven points in three quarters. They didn't even score in the fourth quarter, um, and they nearly got to fifty points. Um, they're averaging forty four points a game, um, and a lot of it is obviously the the, the backfield duo of Major McBride and Halen Flanagan. Uh, in this one, uh, McBride, 24 carries, 192 yards, and two touchdowns. Uh, Flanagan, 29 carries for 114 yards and three touchdowns. Um, 9 of 16 passing, 125 yards um, with a touchdown and uh, two interceptions. Reed Thompson caught the touchdown pass on his on his alone catch. Uh, Jude Bentley led the receivers with two catches for 46 yards. Um, and again, I think... You know, Potsboro's got some got some firepower. Um, you know, I I think they're you know, they're going to be in a, in an interesting spot. The winner of this plays uh, the Teague Whitney winner, um, and so yeah, I mean, I think I think you've got a Potsboro team that's set up to do something um, pretty interesting. And like I said, if we want to dream, uh, if we want to dream about, about what that could be in early December, that would be a that'd be great to see those two teams go on a, on a, on a huge run. But but again. Um, you know, if you're Pottsboro, um, you're facing a team that's three and seven. Um, you should be able to handle that, but don't overlook it. Don't, don't. You don't need to look at Pottsboro, Whitesboro. I can, because that's my job, and that's the fun part of my job is to look at what might be down the road. Um, but um, you've got to take care of business, and they've got. Uh, and and again, as as good as Region One is, uh, Region Two is just as good. There's really good teams up and down the bracket, um, and you got to bring it every game. Um, and, and like I said, you've got a great water team that they've got playoff experience. It's not as, it's not the season they thought they were going to have, but they are in the playoffs. Um, and so that's going to be Pottsboro Gladewater uh, Thursday at 7 at Paris. All right, now to the Division II uh, rankings in 3A. Of course, we talked about Gunner. We got them out of the way. Uh, but we do have two teams that are still playing. And the first team that we'll talk about is the Howe Bulldogs. Um, they are in the playoffs. After they won last week, um, 34 to 15 against Lone Oak, um, they are six and four. Uh, they are playing Palmer, who's nine and zero. Palmer actually had a district by last week, um, so the, that, the Bulldogs come in as the underdog, but they came into the season as underdogs uh, based on their previous uh, seasons. So this 3A Division Two Region Two by district matchup which is Thursday at 7.30 at Lone Oak. So that's kind of interesting that Howe's going to play uh, in Lone Oak two weeks in a row. Um, but regardless of what happens in this game, um, you know, one, Howe got into the playoffs. They got in on a tiebreaker. They got in as um, they got in as the four seed. Um, as part of that, they needed the, the three-way tie that we talked about between Blue Ridge, Howe, and Leonard. Um and Leonard was the odd team out. How got the four seed? Um, first playoff appearance since uh, 2016. You're talking about a team that went 0 and 10 last year, went 0 and 10 the year before. Um, had a a losing a district losing streak going back into 2019. You know they've won as many games. Um, they've won as many games this year as the previous five years combined. So think about that. They've got six wins in ten games, and um, from 2017 to 2021, they had six wins. So it's a fantastic season, no matter what happens. But it's it's really good to see one. They won a game that they had to win. They had to win that Lone Oak game. They found a way to win it. They had guys out due to injury, including starting quarterback Austin Haley. Um, so they rode Antoine Rattler. 37 carries, 270 yards, five touchdowns. Um, they only threw the ball three times. Garen Langford stepped in at quarterback, was 0 for 3. Um, so they ran it 68 times. They gained 424 yards, um, and they won a game they had to win. And then they got the help. They needed Blue Ridge to lose to Gunner, which everybody assumed was going to happen. They needed Leonard to lose to Bells, which we'll talk about here in a second, which a lot of people thought would happen. But then you have the added... Um, the added obstacle of your starting quarterback is out. And so that's obviously going to be a factor for this game. Um, 
I hope Austin Haley's able to play. He's been a four-year starter for them. He basically holds every how passing record there is to have, and I think it would be extremely unfair for a kid to go through all that and all the losing and getting beat up week after week and then have an injury happen right before the playoffs and he doesn't get a chance to play. Um, so obviously that's something to watch for there. They do have a guy in Rattler. If it's, if it, if it does come down to that, um, that, you know, maybe you can just shorten a game, uh, win it ugly. Um, because, uh, because you're, you're just using your ground attack. Um, but again, no matter, no matter how this finishes, and you and I hope that um, we're talking about how playing either uh, Callisburg or Millsap uh, in the area around um, that that how can keep this front going. But at the very least, it's just been a phenomenal turnaround uh, for for Coach Brian and the guys there um, taking over a program that was you know as low as you could could be in terms of the standings, in terms of going winless two years in a row, not having any of these kids with having any semblance of success and to turn that into a six and four so that you're going to have a winning record. Even if you lose this game, um, you've got, a, you've got a, a, a really good foundation, uh, and, and starting culture for the kids coming up, um, to, to emulate, uh, going forward. Um, and hopefully they're, they're able to pull an upset. That would be, that'd be awesome to keep this. And it would just sort of, um, typify how this season has gone for how um they're just continuing to do things you know a lot of people probably still looked at them even though they dropped down and said well they're probably still not going to make the playoff you know um there's other teams in that district that have made the playoffs um maybe they're you know you you just never know how good a team's going to be when they've dropped down and again you look at their losses um and their losses are to um you know three playoff teams and a team that uh lost its last game that if it had won, it had gone to the playoffs. So again, you're talking about beating teams you're supposed to beat um, and, and how it was able to do that to be able to get to the playoffs. So it's been a great, great season no matter what happens, but but hopefully they can pull the upset on Palmer uh, in that 3A Division Two Region Two game, uh, 7.30 Thursday uh, at Lone Oak. Uh, and then the other game at this level, uh, 3A Division Two Region Two by district matchup between Bells and Blooming Grove. Uh, Thursday, 7 p.m. at Mesquite Memorial Stadium. This is a rematch of last season um, when Bells won 40 to 12 in the by district round. Um, Bells comes in at 8 and 2. Uh, they won last week against uh, Leonard 56 to 20. Blooming Grove did not play. They are 7 and 2, uh, and they are they are um, I don't want to say dangerous, but they're they're confident right now because they're about to have uh, if they win. Uh, they'll have their best record since 1991. Um, so they're obviously, uh, you know, they've been having a good year. They're, they're feeling good about themselves. But if you're Bells, um, again, you're, you're, you're coming off second place in this district uh, in 8-3-A. The only team that you were not able to beat is Gunner, and you played them as tough as you have played them, only losing 24-14. to um, You are a team that made the region semifinals last year. Uh, you lost in overtime to... Um, the team that right now is ranked second in the region, uh, second in the state in Holiday. You want to talk about how good this region is? Um, Gunner is ranked number one, Holiday is ranked number two, and Bells is ranked number three. Is ranked number five? Excuse me. So um, three of the top five teams in the state are in this region. Two of them are in our area. It says how good this uh, this area is at this level. Um, and if you're Bells. Um, you know, you think you're good enough to be back in the region semifinals. You want that rematch with Holiday. You want to get to a region final against Gunner because everybody expects Gunner to get there on their side of the bracket. And can can you pull the upsets? Can you win the games that you haven't been able to win against these guys? Can you put it all together? You were so close last year. You were so close this year to Gunner. Um, and, and there's no reason to think that Bells can't do that. We watch them every week. You look at them again this last week. You know, 56 to 20. It's the standard Bell's way. 448 yards on 49 carries. Um, and again, it's the, it's the same cast of characters getting the job done. Uh, Grady Waldrop, 19 carries, 152 yards, three touchdowns. 
Brock Baker, 11 carries, 105 yards. Um, he has um, three touchdown runs and also returns a kickoff, 80 yards for a touchdown. Uh, Spencer Hines, 11 carries, 102 yards. Uh, Jacob Aaron chips in, the quarterback, four carries, 80 yards, and a touchdown run. Um, and it's what it's what Bells has done, you know, under Coach West the last couple of years. They've been a couple times to the region semifinals. They have not been able to get to that region final. That's the hurdle. Can they get there? They've lost to some really good teams that have kept them out, and I'm sure they're thinking this is our year to get through and get to the region final, play for a spot in the state semifinals, um, put together the best year in school history. And that's obviously um, what they're thinking um, going into this matchup. And I think they've got a pretty good chance. Uh, that you know They're obviously the favorites, uh, being as ranked as high as they are, but that rankings don't matter now. You, know, you can say overall records don't matter. Um, it's just what you do on that night. Um, can you take care of business? And so we'll look to see if Bells can do that against Blooming Grove. The winner will play Comanche Henrietta. Um, I'm praying for Henrietta because Comanche's out in the middle of nowhere. Um, unfortunately, um, realignment, uh, when you look at some of the changes, you see some of the teams down the road, you're like, oh, my God. How is this team in our – like, how is Comanche in Region 2? I don't know, but they are. Um, so I'm hoping Henrietta wins for a game that's closer should Bells win um, against Blooming Grove. So that's uh, that's the 3A teams, and we've got uh, three two A two A teams. Uh, we'll work our way down. We'll we'll look at the Division One the excuse me the two A Division One Region Two by district games. We have two of those. Um, the first one we'll talk about is Tioga playing Hamilton. This game is at 7:30 on Thursday at Fort Worth Brewer. Uh, Tioga comes in at eight and two. Uh, they won last week, 34 to 28 in overtime against White Wright. And Hamilton is 5-5. Five and five. They are coming off a 24-0 win against Goldthwaite. Um, so let's talk about last week with Tioga first. So they had already locked up uh, top seed for the playoffs, but you're playing a, a, a white right team that wants to win, doesn't have to win, but it wants to win because it wants as good a seed as, as it possibly can get. Um, and this game was uh, – this game – Prove that um, back and forth. White Wright's up 14 nothing. Then it's 14-14. Then it's 21-14 at halftime. And Tioga's down 28-14 going to the fourth quarter. They find a way to tie it up. They get a stop on fourth and one in overtime and then go and score to win this game 34-28, have an undefeated uh, district season, um, knock White Wright White right down. We'll talk about them here in a second. Um, Chase Evans with a big game for the Bulldogs. 14 carries, 112 yards, three touchdowns, including the game tire and the one in overtime to win it. Uh, Jonah Grubbs, uh, 12 carries for 40 yards and a touchdown. Um, uh, Greeley McAden has four catches, 400 yards and a touchdown. Uh, a touchdown catch from Austin Norwood. Um, and so you're Tioga, you're, you're eight and two. You're having the best season you've had since you moved up to. The uh, eleven man ranks, um, you know, four years ago, um, and this is that incremental thing we talked about with them before the season. They they had had the losing records. They got to five and five, um, and then lost in the first round to Celeste. So they finished five and six last year. Obviously, this is going to be a much better season. It already is. You've got eight wins. You've got a, an undefeated district championship, and I think the the big thing here is again. Don't get too cocky. Don't get too confident that you're eight and two, and this team is five and five. You're still trying to win a playoff game um, at this level since you moved up. They, the one thing that they haven't done that they did, you know, they when they when they moved up from eleven man, you know, that last six man team, those the last couple six man teams had success, but that's that's in the past. None of these guys have anything to do with that. They made the playoffs last year. They lost in the first round in a shootout with Celeste. Can you? Can you handle being the favorite? You're not the underdog anymore. You're not the team that rolls into the playoffs with a 1-8 and eight record or the 1-9 and nine record, and nobody expects anything of you. You're a number one seed. You got, you've got you got an 8-2 record. Um, can you take care of business, at least in the first round? And that's I think that's obviously the biggest thing that the Bulldogs are going to be dealing with. 
Um, the winner plays the Axtell Rosebud a lot winner. Um, Hamilton, um, you know, they, they, they're, they've got nothing to lose. Um, you know, they haven't won more than six games in a season since 2007. So this is one of their better ones. And again, I'm sure their coaches are saying your fourth seed, no one's expecting you to go out there and do it. So just battle your butt off, see what happens. Maybe we can pull an upset. Um, and so I, I think maybe it was a good thing that Tayoga got pushed last week against a team that was desperate, that was trying to win, that had to win to maybe set them up for this week. Um, Maybe that'll go a long way. Um, I, obviously, one of the big things that's going to be interesting to look at, Johnny Dorpinghouse played last week for Tioga. Um, he had a, had a really big sophomore or big freshman year. This year, he was on his way. He's off to a good start, breaks his collarbone, um, you know, essentially missed um, eight, I guess, seven games. Because um, I think he played, through, he played in two and then missed seven and then played this last one. Um, he didn't play on offense in this one. He was on defense. So that'll be interesting to see. Um, that may be an extra wrinkle that maybe some people don't know what they're gonna get um, because he has, you know, if you're looking at film recently, he's not on offense, um, and so maybe they can, uh, they're gonna work him back in. And if not, they they've got this this duo of of Evans and Grubbs has been has been really really good since Dorping House went down. They kind of turned to those two guys and said, okay, it's you two. Um, it's not what we were particularly planning on. We thought we had maybe a three-headed monster, um, and and it turned into be this duo that's that's got that's powered them to this point. So it's going to be interesting to see um, how they handle being the favorites, um, and and if and if Hamilton just kind of pulls out all the stops, uh, if it's a close game, whatever, how can they handle it? And I really think you know if if afterwards if they if they come out with a win and it ends up being closer than expected, or they have to make some plays that. Um, you know, Coach Rogers would look at last week and say, we needed that push from White Wright to get us ready um, instead of just waltzing into the playoffs. Because I think that's the biggest thing, you know, whether you're um, whether you're a Tioga or somebody who's new at this and getting there for the first time or, or in, in this position of, of being one of the, the higher seeds or, or with such a good record, you know, or if you're a Gunner or a Whitesboro, um, you know, some years like this year with a Pottsboro, and we'll talk about one of those teams next with in, in, coming up in Collinsville. You know, can you handle being the favorite? Um, you know, when, when, if Gunner's been the favorite year after year after year, that's all they know. But when you have a team like Tioga or you have a team like Collinsville, which we're going to talk about, who's coming off an average season or not making the playoff season, and all of a sudden all the eyes are on you and every drive takes on added significance and every play – could be the difference. Can you handle when something bad goes wrong, or something? So when something goes wrong, compared to oh everything's going great. Um, and so um, you know that's what I look for with some of these teams. Can they handle the success now that the regular season's over and everyone's talking about how great you are? Can you go out in the playoffs and do something, whether it's a win or two or all the way to state doesn't matter. But especially in the first round, you know when you're a top seed, people are going to be looking at you to to at least get past the first round, and then all bets are off. Um, so that's going to be interesting to see how, how Tioga handles it. Um, and the other game at this level, you talk about teams being able underdogs and nothing to, nothing to lose and against a, a team that um, all eyes are on them. The White Wright Tigers are going to face Toller in a 2A Division I Region II by district matchup, 7 o'clock on Thursday at Springtown. So White Wright comes in at 4-6. and six. Toller comes in at 10-0. and 0. Um, Toller is ranked uh, in the top 10 in the Division One statewide rankings, and if you're white right, nothing to lose. You're in the playoffs. Um, you 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 have played some people tough. Um, you know you just played Tioga tough. Um, you played you lost to Nakona by single digits. Um, you lost to SNS by single digits. So if you look at that four and six, that four and six could easily be seven and three. Um, but you're you're facing an opponent who uh, everybody's looking at them saying, hey, maybe this is a team that can make a run. Hey, we, we think this is one of the ten best teams. This might be the best team in the region, or the second best team in the region. Um, so so it's totally flipped for White Wright. Um, obviously, you're in the playoffs. You've got some a couple guys that have had, um, you know, making the playoffs in the past. Um, but this is another program around here. They've been there. They're trying to get the first playoff win since 2016. Um, 
So can this group find a way to do that? Um, they're, they've obviously played better the last couple of weeks because of um, some injuries, uh, guys getting healthy. Um, in the game against Tioga, um, Maverick Sartain had 12 catches for 115 yards and two touchdowns. Um, I think you could see, obviously, a lot more of that if you're going to find a way to try to beat a tour. Um, uh, Kenneth York, 22 carries for 92 yards and a touchdown. Uh, Jackson Evans added 15 carries for 40 yards. And I think I think the thing with White Wright is they need that balance. They need to not be so one-dimensional that Tor can just line up and say, okay, we're going to stop this, and that's they've got nowhere to turn. And I think seeing what they did against – seeing what White Wright did against Tioga is a good sign. Um, they made some plays in the air. They, they had the balance with the multiple backs, guys running the ball, Tyler Ball – you know, on some keepers and stuff, nine carries for 38 yards. Just being able to keep people honest um, could go a long way. And and I will say this about White Wright. They have made the playoffs as a lower seed. They have they may not have won, but they've put some scares into people. They've had games be closer than a lot of people thought they were going to be. You know, when you say, oh, this team has this record, this team has that record, or this team is, seated, is ranked seeded this, and this team is seeded that, that if this game is close, don't be surprised because – um, they've been in those situations before. The question is, can they pull the upset? And this would be an upset. This would be a, this would be a huge upset um, to try to get to the second round and play the Marlin Rio Vista winner. Um, but if you're white right, you got nothing to lose. Throw it all out there, see what happens, and maybe you can pull off, um, you know, shocks of people um, after the first round's done when people look and say, whoa, where did that come from? Um, and just kind of, um, you know, show how good um, the, I think the potential for White Wright is pretty good. Um, you know, like I said, they've, they've lost some close games. They've lost the teams that are in the playoffs. Um, and so I think, I think, um, again, making the playoffs is, is a big thing as always. Um, but I'm, I'm, I, I don't want to call an outright upset, but if, if, if it's closer than you think, um, I wouldn't be surprised in, in that one as well. Um, as White Wright takes on Toler. And the last game. Uh, is at the 2A Division II, a Region II by district game, Collinsville against Haskell. This game is also on Thursday. A lot of Thursday games this week. Uh, 7 p.m. on Thursday at Jacksboro. Collinsville comes in at 9 and 1. Haskell comes in at 5 and 5. Haskell did not play last week. Kind of weird that a lot of these opponents for our teams had buys the last week. That's I don't know if that's the luck of the draw or what, but that just seems kind of weird. Um, Collinsville did finish off their undefeated district run, um, by beating Chico 44 to six, uh, in a game that we talked about, you know, all they had to do was win that one to get, to not share the title with Santo and, and obviously Chico, uh, coming in with a two and seven record, um, should have been a fairly easy game. And, and it sort of was, um, uh, Logan Jenkins leading the way in that one, um, 28 of 34 passing, for 429 yards and three touchdowns. He also ran in a touchdown. Uh, Nathan Bocanegra was his top tar- target. Nine catches, 152 yards, and two touchdowns. Uh, Colin Barnes, four catches, 405 yards. Um, Carter Scott, five catches for 69 yards. Also had a touchdown run. Uh, R- Rylan Newman, uh, 15 carries for 157 yards and a touchdown run as well. Uh, Connor Ragsdale had a touchdown catch, um, and like I said, cruising, cruising along in this one, all their, all 44 points in the first three quarters, uh, and the defense played very well, um, gave up 149 yards, the touchdown was, um, a fumble recovery, um, on offense, but, uh, so I guess that counts against the defense, um, but again, a very good performance, um, from Collinsville, and, and the big thing with them is going to be, again, can you, um, can you can you control the emotions? Can you handle being the favorite? You know this was a this is a team with so many guys that started last year. There were very few seniors last year when Collinsville went four and six, did not make the playoffs, and now here you are. You're ranked number seven in the statewide rankings for two A Division two. Um, you you beat a, another state ranked team. Uh, who's also who's also nine to one in Santo? You know that you're their only loss. Um, you beat a perennial 
um, a perennial power at this level in Munster. Um, things are going great. Can you handle that? Um, I think they've done a good job. Obviously, you know, they beat Santo and then they had to, they had to beat Munster after that. And they did. Um, and that was a close game. Uh, obviously there were some weather, uh, weather related caveats apply, but still, um, you know, this is a team that is, is, has, has been awesome on, on offense, um, has been, has been pretty good to really good on defense. They they look like the whole package, but the big thing is going to be, can they handle the expectations that they should be receiving the attention for being nine and one and seventh in the in the rankings, um, and you have a Haskell team that obviously is five and five. They didn't play last week, so they've got they've been off for two weeks. Does that affect them? Rest versus rust, always an interesting uh, conversation topic. Um, if if Haskell does win, it's their most win since 2015. So again, you're not talking about a program that's had a whole lot of uh, of winning. Uh, on a year-to-year basis, um, and the winner is going to play the McCamey Roscoe winner in the area round. So, um, again, I think you look at all of our matchups. I think there's a lot of favorable ones. I think we could see more than a handful of teams advancing to the second round, joining Gunner, who's already there. Um, and it's fun because it's the playoffs. Playoffs are here. Everybody's zero-zero. I know. I know. I'm going to say every week this team is this team is this record. This team is that record, um, but it, it it really is whatever happens on that night is what matters, and it doesn't the that night doesn't care if you were ten and zero, and that night doesn't care if you were two and eight. It matters can you can you be better in that forty eight minutes? And so we'll see what happens. Starting Thursday, a lot of Thursday games, only one on Friday, and then we'll see who advances we'll see how long we can go we will do this every week until the last team is out um so we'll do a recap after the last team is out if that ends up being uh after a state championship game which it has been uh the last couple years then so be it if it happens before then um then that's when it happens so we're at the mercy of the the teams that have made it and how far they go and um I look forward to seeing what happens. I think we like said we've got some we've got some really good teams. I think we've got some really good brackets, um, and hopefully we're doing this for a while um, into December with with a with a handful of teams. So again, um, get out there, support your teams. If your team's eliminated, go out and see one of these games. Some of these are good games. I know there's not a lot of close games. Um, you know, there's a little bit of driving involved, but I think I think for some I think it's worth it to go watch some of these teams play. Um, and hopefully we'll get some local matchups down the road. But for now, um, enjoy the first round of the playoffs. Stay safe out there. Thanks for listening to the podcast. I, I always try to mention that because we do this for you, the people, or I do this for you, the people, on a weekly basis. And so I hope you're tuning in, getting some knowledge, getting some nuggets before you go to the game um, so you know what you're looking at. Um, so I thank you for listening. And we'll talk to you next week here on the Herald Democrat Sports Podcast.